Hearing, cities are the problem because that's where most of us live, where increasingly most of humanity, uh, the impacts of humanity are concentrated. But cities are the answer because they offer us an incredible dynamic uh, that if we learn to take advantage of it and we, we uh, apply it to our great challenges, we can have a very effective uh, uh, result. Uh, some of my own uh, research is in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and I've been looking at this. Uh, the incredible delta, look at the difference in the red here here down below, uh, which is a city like Stockholm versus a typical city in the United States, we're not talking about a few percentage points. We're talking about huge deltas of increase of greenhouse gas emissions if we get this wrong, and many other uh, related implications. Uh, and the same is true, unfortunately, around the world, um, that we're exporting this pretty dreadful model of urbanism right around the world, looking at South America, China, India, Eastern Europe, uh, object buildings and super blocks and so on. We need to understand and as Jane Jacobs said, uh, the kind of problem a city is, a problem of uh, organized complexity, as she said, uh, capable of metabolic growth and dynamics. We need to understand and tease out uh, this dynamic and be able to put it to use. Uh, we can understand from other disciplines, uh, as Nassim, uh, Nassim was saying, uh, the kind of pragmatic lessons from things like network theory, understanding how a system of connections functions in an urban system, as we understand already in, in social and economic systems. Systems. Uh, and then these are related to other insights that are coming out of other fields uh, in uh, the uh, sciences of complexity as we're beginning to tease out uh, understanding uh, the processes of self-organization that happen in cities uh, and autocatalytic effects and how people can work together and generate some of the effects. Again, Asim was talking about uh, Kevin Lynch. We need a theory of good city form. We need to inform our design strategies uh, and have that on the table so that we can challenge it and analyze it and understand uh, what's working or not. If we don't do that, as Jane Jacobs said, we're likely to be guilty of pseudoscience. We're not much better than the plague doctors who uh, use their potions and incantations. We need the urban equivalent of a germ theory uh, in medicine or a particle theory in physics, uh, a kind of grand unified theory of good city form. And I think we have uh, the resources available to do that. Uh, so very briefly, I'm going to run through some of those. Uh, thinking of the city as a complex uh, self-organizing network uh, consisting of human beings and their exchanges. That's how the creativity and the dynamism that you heard about last night happens. A uh, second point is that these cities function best when they feature pervasive connectivity and inclusion, as my friend uh, Luis Betancourt at Santa Fe Institute has pointed out. Uh, and there are certain spacings of that that are critical that we have to get right. Uh, some research I and my colleagues have done showing about a 400 meter spacing between principal arterials is very important. Down to the finer grain of blocks and plots, uh, that have to be spaced about right. This is my hometown of Portland, and that continuous fabric stretches right over uh, freeways and over, in this case, this is a big uh, shopping mall, uh, uh, Pioneer Place, so it's possible to have walkable urbanism all the way around. Here's a hospital, a Good Samaritan Hospital, that has walkable fabric all the way around it. Uh, Portland State University, uh, which has a there we go, which has a, uh, again, a walkable carpet of urbanism all the way around it. Uh, uh, industrial districts in Portland uh, that also have that uh, walkable fabric. So it is possible uh, to maintain a continuous uh, walkable arterial system uh, in a modern city. And I think we've got to get that right. Uh, if we're going to uh, meet the great challenges. Uh, and we have to get down to the scale of individual buildings and spaces. This is a street where I used to live in London. And what you'll notice is that there are many different places that people can occupy uh, and move through and control the spaces and interact with one another. And that forms an actual, a very complex network of spaces that people uh, can, can control and move through uh, and modify as they, uh, as they need to and as they uh, move through the spaces. And that's critical. Uh, and look what's happened over a period of about seven years. I came back to this place, very interesting, and you'll see the transformation over time uh, where people have actually added little structures of fences and hedges and different things and actually mutated that. That's what happens over time in a great city, and that's what happens in great cities like Venice over centuries. Here's a situation uh, over about 100 years going with the very uh, sort of boring cadastral plan of Venice on the left, uh, the transformation of that over time into a much richer 
richer and more uh, complex uh, structure as uh, the city that we all know and love. And that, I would suggest to you, is what great cities are all about, what great urbanism is all about. Uh, it's a surprisingly complex, but it's a self-organizing uh, network structure. And it has biophilic characteristics as well. It has characteristics that uh, we can understand and interact with and we find uh, desirable if we're going to uh, live in those places, in urban places that have a higher density. That's very important as well. So I think we have uh, the basis of uh, what we might call a grand unified theory uh, of how human beings use urban space uh, and how we can support that with design. Going from the smallest spaces uh, inside the buildings out to the outside into the largest uh, systems of the city uh, and the networks of the city. This is a point that my friend uh, Christopher Alexander also uh, used in his pattern language theory, using networks of design in order to create uh, uh, tools that will allow us to uh, exploit these powers of self-organization uh, and complex adaptive systems. That's been incredibly useful in things like software design. That's the basis of the iPhone and, and iPad and other software. Uh, and also uh, the uh, basis of Wiki and Wikipedia. Uh, my colleague Ward Cunningham and I are working on a system right now that will use those tools uh, to develop much more complex, uh, more uh, self-organizing kinds of processes. So I think we do have the tools the resources at hand. I think we need to replace our outmoded and failing models and ways of thinking uh, about novelty and art and the sort of uh, cloaking on top of that. We have a great opportunity coming up uh, with Habitat 3 in 2016 uh, to define what the UN is calling a new urban agenda. And I think uh, I, we're very excited to be working on that. Uh, and I hope we'll have the opportunity to work with some of you on that as well. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, I enjoyed the talks today. I had a, a comment that I wanted to address to, to one of you specifically. It was actually Michael. And then I was hoping that another couple of you or, or others would be able to reflect on that as well. And it's about this um, very thought-provoking notion of the grand unified theory of urban design. It really sparked my attention. I was hoping you could just spend a couple of minutes expanding on that a little bit and um, you know, how, how sufficiently vague, for example, that, that would need to be to be universally applicable to all cities and cultures. And then I, I hoped I could hear maybe from Don and perhaps Adrian about how uh, such a grand unified theory would be relevant to Surrey, close to home here, and maybe Shenzhen, so far away and so, so different. Uh, you were asking the framework of urban design that I was talking about, is that right? The, the, the grand unified theory. Oh, the grand, theory grand unified theory, yeah. that. <laughs> um, I mean, there are a lot of elements that are out there already. Uh, obviously, we are all familiar with Jane Jacobs' work and some of the work coming out of places like the uh, Santa Fe Institute. And uh, uh, interestingly, uh, Jeffrey West, who's there at the uh, Santa Fe Institute, talks about um, they're doing Jacobs with the math, he likes to put it. Um, and so there are a lot of pieces that are there uh, that I think we can pull together and I think what we need to do is put them into, um, as Asim was saying, a kind of working um, uh, pragmatic approach to urban design that gives us some of the, uh, uh, some of the framework parameters that will allow uh, this self-organization to occur that I was talking about that really harnesses the uh, capacity that cities have, the great capacity that we see in informal settlements and we see in uh, many places in the world uh, that we're not getting with the, um, the, the, the sort of uh, command and control approaches, the older models um, that are incredibly resource intensive and uh, incredibly uh, destructive of our uh, ecologies and well, depleting Mike, of our resources. And Michael, uh, can I interject a question? Can you think of a zoning code that does that, that allows things to self-organize? Can you give us one American or Canadian example of a zoning code? Yeah, I'd like specifics here. Uh, one example of an existing one somewhere that... Yeah, or if you can, a proposed one, a proposed change. Well, I gave examples of Portland, uh, and partly that was a historical accident of the grid, the small grid and the walkable uh, urbanism and so on. And I think the zoning that has happened there is reinforcing and, and supporting that. Uh, that. That would be a good example. Since we're not all up here to agree, I assume, um, it, I, I actually, I don't accept the notion <laughs> of a grand unified theory, although I, or, or maybe I put it another way. I think that we have to be very careful about 
where the bundle of ideas that is bound up in the grand unified theory, I actually think there are prerequisites that, have to, that are both cultural and physical about where that grand unified theory is likely to work. And that what concerns me in a lot of ways in my own experience in the New York region is that I have a lot of trouble, I think I would have a lot of trouble calibrating the grand unified theory to 75 to 80 percent of the landscape that I see out there. It doesn't mean it isn't worth trying and it doesn't mean there aren't pockets where it will work, but I, I'm skeptical about my ability to kind of spread it out over the landscape the way it's evolving. I do want to say that I think that your question about, well, can you give an example or Pat's question? I think that there is a, the, the, the closest thing to it in my mind is a, the world of what's called performance-based zoning, where you don't actually try to specify uses or even the sizes of things. You try to institutionalize a set of performance ideas, right? So, for instance, um, Milan, as I understand it, uh, is now is literally about to citywide implement a performance-based regimen for the entire city. There are not going to be any more things where you look up zones and you figure out what you can build or not build based on some prescriptive lists, but a set of criteria about how much noise do you make, how much traffic do you create. Um, you know, we don't care what you do as long as you don't take deliveries at three o'clock in the morning. You know, the challenge of all those performance-based regimens, and I really believe in them, I think in a lot of ways that is the way to kind of sort of regulate an organic process, is that the burden, the administrative burden, is enormous. The number of places that will have the ability to send somebody out at three o'clock in the morning and say, you said you weren't gonna have deliveries at three in the morning, but you're doing it, uh, that takes an enormous amount of capacity. And so I, I love the idea of it, of a kind of a performance-based and organic land use regulation regimen. But uh, there are, and there are some experiments, but I think they tend to be at the city scale and the district scale, uh, not necessarily at kind of the regional scale. Uh, sorry, just to jump in, I actually like your idea that we don't all have to agree, but I actually agree with both Michael and Rob. So. <laughs> Uh, with Michael, obviously, uh, I do believe theory is it how we think about cities, absolutely, especially if we're in a university setting. This is the place to do profound thinking. I get it, there's a rush to solutions, we are desperate for answers, but I'm just like, chill, a little bit, just think a little bit before, I mean, there's tons of, thousands of people out there rushing to solutions every day and doing all kinds of things, uh, a lot of them screen them up. So, and obviously, I'm also a big admirer of Kevin Lynch. I would highly recommend it for the students, if there's one book to read on, theory of urban design, it's good city form, read it and reread it. Uh, but where I agree with Rob, I am also very skeptical of a grand unified theory of urban design. And I will, what I said, what Rob said, I'll add to it, two statistics, very important. 84%, 84% of the world's population lives in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. 7.1 billion people, out of which 84% Second statistic, 97 out of the 100 world's fastest growing cities are also in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Theories come out of specific places. Theorizing from New York, Toronto, Vancouver, London, to the rest of the world, I think is kind of dangerous. And so we have to also be very nuanced about when we say universal something, I'm always very cautious. So I think there's room for multiple theories that can be tested through practice, coming back to your solutions thing, like performance zoning, there's form-based codes, there's a bunch of things like, we don't have to be for and against things, let's try things out very thoughtfully, work with communities rather than on communities, etc. That's a good explication of your theory, and I'm, I'm glad we got there, and I'm gonna be a little aggressive about making sure that not all eight of you answer every question, because I've been to forums where that happens, and I hate that too. And it's much better to have people in the uh, group to converse. So Trevor, it's your turn. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. A uh, few better ways to spend a rain rainy uh, afternoon than to hear about cities. Uh, I'd like to scare out a kind of implicit uh, idea today that needs talking about, but it may be hard, but I'll try. Um, I think it was triggered by Asim's reflections on American pragmatism as a kind of philosophical, potential philosophical basis for urban design. Um, it's very, very interesting. Those of us who went through the theory wars of architecture schools of the 80s and 90s, I can tell you, you could not give away American uh, uh, pragmatism. 
uh, uh, Richard Rorty and uh, notions of contingency, anti-foundationalism. We architects thought that theory would be big, French, complex, and other things. And I know this particularly well because I toured Japan with Isazaki Isom and Jacques Derrida, Frederick Jameson, et cetera, and found, saw the kind of beginnings of the end of the age of theory. Things are different for, our, for urban design though. I, I think we have this struggle in urban design trying to find a theory or a position. And uh, you've put forward pragmatism as one. And you could pack Jane Jacobs, who is really is, a, is not a theorist and never was. She's a beautiful writer and an observer of cities, but doesn't have, doesn't have a great schema. If the schema is anything, it is American pragmatism. I think a lot of us West Coasters are influenced by Christopher Alexander. His big theory failed. But the little handbook, uh, you know, worked. And in places like Portland, Vancouver, Seattle are very much influenced by that. So I guess the big rhetorical question to the whole panel, or to anyone who wants to jump on this, is should a new small urban design program have a position? And should it look for a theory? Well, I think um, as we think we live, I think uh, Asim said that and, and others have said that, we do need to be aware, as Kevin Lynch argued, of what our propositions are and put them on the table. And that's really what I meant about the grand unified theory. It isn't that we want a foundational theory uh, necessarily, but I do think it's important for uh, design schools to recognize the importance of um, the thinking, the, pre the presumptions, the theoretical assumptions about um, about design and understand some of the currents, the philosophical currents, uh, like pragmatism, uh, like structuralism and post-structuralism. There's a fascinating. I think Jacobs is a little closer to a, a neo-structuralist position, uh, maybe along with Christopher Alexander, and and that's all a very rich thing for students to think about in terms of well, how are we approaching our subject matter here and how are we uh, developing our responses um, in a way that's effective. Uh, ultimately, that's what pragmatism is asking. I'm going to pass the mic, but just while I'm passing it, uh, uh, a real, you know, real life experience in the last couple of days, I was asked to advise on a proposal for uh, a new capital city in Andhra Pradesh, India, for 10 million people. And uh, some of you may have seen this uh, prospectus. And, you know, it plunged right into all of the sort of criteria for sustainability and so forth. And it's quite ambitious. But what occurred to me is, you know, if I had to actually deal with this, is what are the questions that people really need to ask themselves about this project? And I think perhaps rather than a, a grand theory or theory, what a new urban design program needs is a set of questions that it's exploring. And I, I think there's at least a minority on this panel that probably is sympathetic to that. Um, I, I also think, I think theory is very important. And um, I'm happy that somehow pragmatism and post-structuralism seem to have like um, met each other through like Deleuze and Deleuze's interest in William James and um, Whitehead and I think there's an interesting <laughs> kind of, there isn't as much of a divide anymore between American pragmatism and uh, French uh, thinking and I guess